so welcome to the uh, slightly disorganized by me start of this zoom call from the UK CCS Research Center and in uh, aligned with our theme of all comers are welcome for everything all time we're going to extend way across out from traditional engineering into uh, law and not just law but into environmental law and not just into environmental law but into one of the premier practitioners of environmental law in the UK and indeed I would imagine in the world but you know the UK will do for the moment. So Richard McCrory has been uh, a practitioner of environmental law for more years than he cares to remember so I'm going to have a conversation with Richard about his life and times though he's technically now retired but uh, I don't think that makes a huge amount of difference except where your money comes from uh, and we'll I want to uh, scope this out with Richard in incredible detail to have three headings so we'll talk about uh, environmental law in general for a little while uh, for maybe 10 minutes or so and then I'll throw the floor open to the people on the call and you can ask questions if you've got any for five minutes and then we'll move on to carbon capture and storage and the applications of uh, law and legislation to carbon capture and storage for maybe 20 minutes or so, the uh, bulk of the conversation. And then I'd like to uh, try finishing off or heading towards the exit by talking about Brexit and what that means for uh, the UK position on environmental law. Uh, so having outlined that and after each of those three sections then we'll I'll try and go back to the audience if you like the participants here and ask if there's any questions for Richard and he can take his chance and ably defend himself but because he's a practicing barrister I'm sure he's well able to do that we'll see <laughs> and I remind you of course as Vic has just said that questions can be typed into the chat and that makes it easier to stack up the questions uh, on the way through uh, so I don't feel you need to wait until the last minute. So anyway, Richard, I'm going to start you off. Uh, so my understanding is that uh, you're here partly because you've written a textbook on cap carbon capture and storage, which we'll come to in the second part, uh, but also because you've just uh, published what in some ways is a memoir and a summary called Irresolute Clay, which is a, a sort of life and times of an environmental lawyer. And from that, I got the impression that you joined environmental law before it was environmental law. So I'm wondering how, you, if you could tell us a little bit about the very earliest days and what it meant to be working with Friends of the Earth and uh, environmental groups and how that evolved into being a more formal environmental law position in the UK. Okay, um, well, we're, we're going back to the early 70s, which is probably before many people are attending probably even born. Um, <laughs> I studied law at university and I'd qualified as a barrister but I don't know why I just didn't feel it was yet for me or full-time practice. Um, Friends of the Earth had just opened offices in London and they'd had a very successful campaign um, about non-returnable bottles which were beginning to be introduced by the drinks industry and they dumped masses of bottles at Schweppes headquarters to try and make the point. And I saw that at university and I thought this is very interesting and it's a witty campaign and it's quite, it's quite different from the older style conservation groups in Britain. It was bringing a sort of fresh blood. And I just thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to offer my legal services to them? I'd be very interested to work. And amazingly, they took me on. It was then a very small organisation, about 12 people in London, some very bright people working on energy and transport. And I was ready there as a, a, a sort of legal advisor, if you like. And I think what was interesting at that stage, and we're talking about 1976, um, we didn't really take cases in the courts. We didn't use the courts at all, partly because it was extremely expensive and the judges weren't really very sympathetic to um, environmental claims. It seems, you know, it's, and it's difficult taking litigation even now. But we got involved in, and I did in parliamentary work, uh, in major public inquiries, trying to put forward new perspectives on doing things. So I did that for about three years and it really developed my interest. But as you say, at that stage, um, 
there really wasn't something called environmental law as such. We had, going back to the 19th century, we had lots of public health laws, we had wildlife protection laws and so on, but there wasn't something people would recognize and call environmental law. And I suppose, and you must stop me, I, I could just carry on and on. Um, what was then again very interesting Imperial College um, had decided to start a new master's course, which they called environmental technology. But the then rector, Lord Flowers, who had chaired the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, was very keen that these scientists didn't just study science, but they understood about law, about government, about economics. He really wanted to create a kind of new cadre, if you like, of decision makers who, who could really contribute. And Imperial College decided to look for somebody who could teach environmental law. And again, it shows you, you know, what stage it was. They went to, they don't have a law school, they went to all the law schools in London who said, well, we don't teach environmental law. We do planning law, but that's not what you want. And luckily, I think because I'd annoyed them probably in the last three years, the then Department of the Environment had my name on their books and said, well, try Richard McCrory. He seems to know something about this. And I started as a visiting lecturer, uh, really enjoyed both the teaching and teaching bright, clever, mainly scientists then, um, and also working in that environment. So that's really how I started my career, not working in a conventional law school, but working with environmental scientists. And, and well, in a way that's continued a lot through my career that I've crossed and worked with other disciplines and find that very stimulating. So are you still moonlighting at Friends of the Earth during that time as well? Um, I, there was a sort of crossover. I think I was, uh, and then I also did, I was doing my, what they call the pupillage at the bar where you're yeah. actually learning on the job, but you don't earn any money. And so it was pretty tight. <laughs> and so actually having some visiting lecturing uh, fees was extremely useful and then they said you know we like your presence here and initially you know I think I'm sure you've done it it's always good to take oh we can see you now I think yeah, uh, some risks in your career and they said we could have the money for a two-year appointment that's all we've got this is not a probationary appointment we don't know what will happen at the end and I discussed with my wife the pros and cons of being more an academic than a practicing barrister and we decided that was a more fruitful thing. And so I had sort of two years to make my mark and luckily I did. And then they offered, you know, a, a tenured place. Yeah. But so that's a little bit like anybody who's one of the postdoctorals listening at the moment, then that's a wee bit like present system that you can uh, take a job offer for two years with no guarantees. Yeah. And then you, you, and in fact, what I did, I mean, I suppose I was uh, cunning is not the word, but I'd worked out, you know, I like this, I need to make my mark, but within two years, you know, I will not establish significant research. And yeah. so I decided to organize a conference of the like of which Imperial had never had before. And this was about nuclear power. We'd had the big wind scale inquiry on reprocessing, which I'd been involved in, but mm -hmm. now there was size well B was being planned, major inquiries. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to bring together, not just scientists, but judges, lawyers, civil servants. And we had, you know, it was one of those conferences, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but it really had a buzz to it. And Imperial thought, this is terrific. And I think that was probably what made my mark and then the um, extended post. So whether that's advice also for <laughs> yeah, people looking for jobs, I don't know. Do something new, be bold. So was that the same Flowers that did a Flowers report on nuclear? Yeah, nuclear yeah. And, and Flowers was actually, um, you know, you don't sort of think of it at the time, but now I look back and I realise what an extraordinary character he was. Not only, I think, some of his Royal Commission reports, which are now, what, 20, 30 years ago, but they're still worth reading. They've still got things to say. Um, the nuclear industry, he'd come out of the nuclear industry. They apparently, he told me, they never forgave him for that report because he wasn't anti-nuclear power, but he basically said, key thing, we've got to solve the problem of radioactive waste. You know, we can't just go ahead without solving that. And they didn't like that at all. But I also, you know, realized how innovative he was um, in not only thinking, I want an environmental lawyer on the staff at Imperial, 
but actually choosing me because I was a rather unlikely candidate, you know, coming, Friends of the Earth then had, you know, a reputation, a bit wacky, all a bit bohemian, of what, what, you know, what's going on. But, you know, he, he took the gamble as well. And I, I think it paid off for, for us all. And I'm um, sticking with that theme just for a minute because yeah. disposal of radioactive waste it has informed some people's thinking about disposal of carbon dioxide. Yeah. In terms of who got liability, long lived storage, yeah. etc. Yeah. So I remember, I see uh, anyway, that in, you did a whole report on subsea disposal of radioactive waste about un, under the actual sea. Does that link in any way to people's work um, on capture and storage? Well, I suppose in some ways, I suppose the, the, I mean, the difference, particularly with the, obviously with high level radioactive waste, I mean, it, it is far more hazardous than um, CO2 will ever be, as you know, you know, um, and I think that's probably the, um, you know, still the biggest challenge. And I don't, I, I'm not keeping up to date with it all, but I think it still hasn't been really satisfactorily resolved in this country. I don't think. Oh, right. I so don't last think week in any, any radioactive watchers will have noticed that Radioactive Waste Management Agency last week had three drop-in sessions for trying to get people to solve the problem of radioactive waste disposal. So the same. And, and if you think, I mean, that is extraordinary that the Royal Commission and Flowers, you know, identified that as the weak link yes. or, or the link to be solved, what, 30 years ago. So it shows the extreme vacillation in, in, in uncertainty that the British uh, yeah. establishment can have in actually making a decision. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, so from, I'm going to move on a little bit. So I think you went to um, Oxford for a while. Yeah. And were you involved in, the, was that the fat early days of the Environmental Change Institute? Yes, it was. Um, in fact, I was the... Um, the second director, I, I was on the board at the beginning. Um, but again, it was interesting. I mean, again, it was a risk I took. I rather surprised they, they came to me and said, be director. And I was, I'd been 10 years at Imperial. And I think, again, you know, when you've been 10 years and it's, you, you either got to decide, I need to move on a bit, or you're going to be there for the rest of your career. You know, I think 10 <laughs> years is quite a good uh, timing. And I think to a certain extent, I realized, you know, environmental law, and I hope I contributed, was developing a lot. There were now environmental lawyers at the law schools and so on. And there was a danger of being actually a little bit isolated in Imperial College. So I was sort of working something out in my mind. What's the next stage I want to do? And the Oxford job came up. But uh, so I took the risk. And although some of it was extremely stimulating, um, it was one of those new centers which, um, and you know, with, within traditional university structures, they're often very difficult to run. And I was told, you know, I said, I'm not going to raise core funding for you. I'll get you research going, I'll bring a new profile. And I, I was assured that all the core funding was there. But <laughs> within sense. about a day, I realized it wasn't there. You and are, mate, this was a center, sorry? You are the core funding. I am the core funding. and. In a way, I, I, and I did it for about a year, and I just decided this wasn't for me. I didn't, I, I, I didn't um, sort of go very public about it. I left a memo saying, I think this is what you need to do if you want the center to really work. And you know, one, one of the problems, it hadn't got a really sponsoring department, so it was all a bit isolated. And Oxford is a very weird system, if you've had contact, I mean, some, some wonderful aspects, but it is, um, quite <laughs> well, incoherent, shall I say, that, um, you know, I thought I was the university centre on the environment. Well, the colleges are all independent and they were starting environmental centres. So it was a bit, it was, it, it, it's still um, um, a nightmare. Anyway, I let, and in fact, they did act on all the things I said. And somebody said, well, you, by leaving, you achieved what might have taken you about 12 years to achieve it if you'd worked within the system. And it's now, you know, it's a highly flourishing um, centre. But what also came out of that, I decided actually what I needed to do was to join a law school and work with lawyers. Because what was interesting, and it's still interesting about environmental law, is that it keeps coming up against other areas of law, like trade law or competition law. And I needed to work 
with the experts in those those fields to find out how they were thinking about issues. Yeah. Um, and so I got offered at uh, UCL in London uh, to join the faculty there. Yeah. And that's really been my home ever since. And that was a very, you know, it was a very friendly faculty. And it was a, it was a, I think one of the things with Oxford is, I, it took me a bit of time to realise that, that if you propose something, the reaction is to fire it down. I mean, they're sort of testing you, but there's no sort of enthusiasm. They'd say, well, you can't do it and you have to keep fighting. Whereas I find at UCL, you know, you propose initiative and we'll come on to this carbon capture. And basically, they say, yeah, that looks great. How can we support it? And I, for me, that was a, just a preferable atmosphere. I still have connections in Oxford. but okay. um, So before we move on to uh, University College, I'll just pause for a minute in case there are any questions from the audience. We've talked about the very early emergence of a perception of uh, law as an influence in the environment and working in three organisations creatively at the start of Friends of the Earth, the start of the Imperial College environmental programmes and then the uh, Oxford Institute. So they're all well-established embedded organisations in the UK firmament now. So, but has anybody got any questions or comments you want to make from the audience just now? Put it in chat or raise your hand if you've got that ability. No, oh, I've got a question. Uh, John, 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 yeah, that's what I reckon. Uh, we, we, we talked about nuclear, and maybe, we, maybe we've done it in some ways, but what do you think the CCS industry could learn from the nuclear industry? Because, um, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't know, nuclear industry's got a 50 or a 70 year start on us, as it were. But uh, I don't want to be looking back in 50 years time and going, oh my gosh, you know, why do we do the same things? again or, or whatever um yeah well i mean may, maybe we should come back to that when we talk about can we actually do can we talk when we get on to ccs yeah yeah because it's quite relevant in a way how you know i got into ccs because the yeah. nuclear stuff was relevant and then we could talk about the lessons but could, i mean could i just mention well i don't know what your next question is but sort of why i wrote this particular book the well, if we, uh, i'll just pause see if we've got any more oh, comments yes. in the audience just briefly sorry john i'll come back to that, yeah, we'll come back to that. so i'll move on to going to uh, imperial college just now but my answer to richard's incipient question there was lots and lots of countries have examined radioactive waste disposal just like uh, carbon capture and storage disposal and just like carbon capture and storage, the Americans have built one and then decided they don't quite like it. <laughs> and, uh, a Scandinavian country is well on its way to embedding and placing nuclear waste underneath its landmass, being Finland. Uh, and we saw two days ago that Norway has now committed to funding its carbon capture and storage project. So the lesson is to actually have governments which decide either from a total capitalist point of view or from a very socialist point of view and where unhappily in the middle. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, going to um, University College, big university in London, you then created a program of environmental law and I guess a lot of this book, Irresolute Clay, uh, which is there, I actually have a physical copy, uh, is following on from those in those life and times as well. So why did you pull this together? What does the title well, mean? Why is yeah, it so yeah. on the front? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, well, I think, uh, obviously, I've written a number of, you know, legal books on environmental law and articles and all of that. But as you say, I became, I think it was about 18 months ago, an emeritus professor at UCL, which is a sort of retirement. And I was reflecting and I and it was just at the time I was doing a lot of work about Brexit and environmental law. And I realized I got into environmental law, Friends of the Earth, and it was just at the time when something called the Control of Pollution Act 1974 had been passed. And indeed, I wrote a sort of citizen's guide to that act. And although I describe it as the first modern environmental law in this country, because although it was based on previous types of controls of regulation uh, of, of pollution and so on, um, it was really the first law that introduced lots of rights of public participation in decision making, lots of new rights to public information, and it tried to, well, it, it, it sort of treated them separately, but for the first time, it tried to put waste law, um, air pollution, uh, noise, 
and, and some water law into the same bit of legislation. So I realized, well, that's quite an interesting arc. You know, I've been at the beginning and I've been at the end. But what I wanted to write was a book which is not a textbook as such, but very much my personal experiences of what it's actually like trying to do things. And although I do, I start at the beginning, Friends of the Earth, and I end, well, you could call it the end or you could call it the start of a new beginning at Brexit. In between, I haven't gone chronologically. I've taken quite big themes like creating academic environmental law, practicing, um, and so on, and explored those themes, and, and, and then dealing with regulatory sanctions for government and all of that sort of stuff, which actually sort of they passed over each other in time, but I think they're separate themes. So um, I hope, it, I think it's really designed for the next generation of younger environmental lawyers, but I tried to write it so it's reasonably accessible to the what do they call it? The intelligent non-lawyer. I think you could read it. Some of it you'll find probably extremely, when we get into sewage law, which actually is quite exciting, um, you'll probably glaze over, but um, uh, bits of it. And I'm also a great believer in, uh, you know, in the importance of personalities, which I wanted to bring out. Oh. And uh, there were sort of key people. I mentioned Lord Flowers and another one who is much under you know, underrated in a sense, was Michael Meacher, who was a Labour minister in uh, the Environment Department. Um, Tony Blair didn't really like him because he was a rather old-fashioned kind of public school lefty. Um, but for some reason, he took a great interest in environmental law. And I had, and he initiated some very important reports about sanctions and access to justice, which still resonate today. So I wanted to bring out some of these um, personalities, which I think have I was, I was the uh, archetypal lay reader then. I was very struck by the frequency you dwell on personalities and the influence that individuals have in that yeah. individual contact. And, well, uh, well, I think my, my experience, I mean, there are, yeah, go on, sorry. I was going to say there's almost a sort of, it's working with networks of people who you have trust in and have the expert knowledge and actually want to do something at pivotal, create a pivotal moment, really. Yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think the title, as you say, um, "Irresolute Clay," which is which is here, if that's coming up. Um, that was actually taken from a poem by C. Day Lewis, which I rather like about watching his. I think he was about ten-year-old son or nine-year-old son playing football at school, and instead of coming back to his father, sort of walking back into the school and having to become somebody rather independent and free, and he talks about nature's small scorching ordeals that fire your irresolute clay and he means you know it's never fully shaped and I decided you know you can either apply that to me because I'm still learning lots of things about environmental law I don't know everything at all and it's constantly challenging um, or you could you could say it's about the subject itself because environmental law again isn't static at all it's it's it, it, because the environment keeps bringing new challenges the law has to um, deal with that and the, the, the cover actually was taken from a um, painting by a, a friend of mine, which I actually bought, I really liked it. Um, my wife says it looks like me with a very dirty jacket and a rather desk. But again, it's meant to be, I think it symbolizes work in progress really, which can apply to the environmental law itself. So I can see that in boxes behind you in fact as well. But, uh, <laughs> so, and because you alluded then, let's get on to carbon capture and storage because yeah. you've yeah. also got uh, a big or co-edited a really big book now in its second edition yeah. on of carbon capture and storage law. So if anybody wants to understand regulation around the world and processes of law in different places, that's a good enough compendium to start with. But you'd spoken about uh, convening, um, meeting and bringing together legalist and regulator establishments for nuclear power. So how important and how enabling do you think that a legal framework can be for carbon capture and storage? Because well, many people I, think it's disabling, but it can yeah. be. Well, I think, um, well, I think a legal framework is, um, is absolutely essential because um, what a legal framework can do is to introduce some sense of predictability and certainty which certainly industry and investors need but um, you know as we saw we'll come back to this maybe that you know the EU produced probably the first uh, integrated carbon 
capture law, dealing with carbon capture as, a, as an issue about global warming, um, introduced the law. I mean, it's got, we can come back to that. It's got weaknesses, but it was, it was pretty comprehensive. But that in itself has not dealt with issues of public confidence and public acceptability of um, CCS. So the law, I think, is, is, is essential, but it won't deal with a lot of problems. And I think interesting, and this brings back to John's point, I mean, my first awareness of CCS as, as a, if you like, as, as, as a technology um, came out of the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, which I was a member. And in 2000, we did a big study on energy. And we were looking forward to about 2050, um, about global warming. And at that time, I have to say, the UK government witnesses had just no forward thinking of that period. They, they were looking to the Kyoto Protocol, which was about eight years ahead, but going no further than that. And we thought it's essential. And we reduced this, it was then 60% reduction target, and it went up to 80 and it's now 100%. And then in the various sort of scenarios, looking at, uh, you know, what are the realistic options? Um, you know, we looked at, could you do it all by alternatives and energy conservation? And theoretically you could, but it would mean massive probably lifestyle changes. And I think all the, the people on the commission thought, well, they're going to have to be some base load um, stations, which have got to be carbon free. And at that point, it was very interesting. The scientists on the commission, um, some of them said, well, nuclear power is the option. I mean, that's the only, only option we've got. Uh, and others completely disagreed, didn't like nuclear power, and they said the waste issue still hasn't been solved. And so we can't, you know, we've got to be very careful on that. And then CCS was just emerging as a technology um, which could possibly deal with gas and coal-fired power stations and get rid of the carbon. And so in that report, interestingly, we presented it as an alternative to nuclear power. We said, you know, you're going to have to have some of these base load power stations and, you know, you've either got to have nuclear or you've got to have carbon capture. Now, uh, that was quite interesting and that got a consensus on, on, on the commission. Now, I don't think then, of course, once it got to government who accepted the then 80% reduction, um, they've always sort of really presented nuclear as, a, as just and CCS as, as one of many options. But I think for dealing with, um, you know, public concern about nuclear power, and now we've got the costs, you know, you, you could present CCS as a realistic alternative. It's not how it's done in the industry and it's done in government, but that was how the Royal Commission um, looked at it. So that was how I first got interested. And then, as you said, there were some interesting legal issues. And when I got to UCL, I think it was about 2008, you had, uh, and actually at national level, the uh, Department of Energy were beginning to do draft regulations pre the EU directive, the EU commission were developing that directive. And there was a lot of stuff going on at international at the Law of the Sea conference, no, not the Law of the Sea, the North Sea conference. And I thought, well, let's get a conference, get all these people together, and discuss these issues, and realize during the conference that many of these experts didn't even know what the other people were doing. You know, they couldn't keep up with it all, what was happening. Yeah. And I thought, well, that would be very interesting to launch a, a legal program on CCS the core of which would be a free resource site, which would try and capture all the kind of legal developments taking place, whether it was international, EU level, or at national level, all around the world. Um, and again, and you would appreciate anybody seeking funding, I thought, well, th this is moving very fast, this world, and I've got to get this going quickly. And if I went to one of the research councils, it would probably take about a year to get any funding at all. And so instead, I went to um, industry and the Crown Estates and a few bodies like that. And it was a very different experience. It was not easy, you know, because you have to know precisely what you want, give a presentation at quite high level saying, this is why I'm doing it. And I want funding initially for two. And then it went to five years. But you get a decision very quickly for quite large sums of money because it was about, I think, about half a million eventually we, we, we got. Um, but they come back, you know, perhaps within a month, you know where you are, whereas, so that, that was interesting. So that allowed us to launch a programme, and I hired um, Ian Havercroft, who was my 
assistant who had been on the master's course, who's now a leading figure in the Global Carbon Capture Story Institute. And we, so we developed that program um, dealing with regulation. And in fact, not, I mean, the, the resource site was very important, but then we obviously introduced critical reports, held conferences, and as you said, um, launched a book on the subject. Yeah. So I see those that were your sponsors at that time were really nothing to do with electricity or heat companies. They were Shell and Schlumberger and Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto, yeah. And I, so I, very yeah. much upstream producers of uh, owners of yeah. CO2 have managed to stay really quite quiet subsequently about that liability. Yeah. Um, well, I think to be, I mean, to be fair with them, they, they, uh, I, you know, I don't know there at that time though, if they had, they were also interested in the subject, uh, whether they're going to do a big investment. But on the program, um, we did a kind of model where they, it was called a donation model, where they just literally donated the money mm -hmm. and there were no deliverables to them. They never interfered with what we were doing. We'd obviously invite them to meetings and conferences and I learned things um, from them and particularly Crown Estates as you know is very important in the UK for um, undersea disposal but um, it was very much a program that was completely independent in what in in in, in what we did and yeah. I haven't I haven't since I haven't kept up with you know whether they're still doing work on CCS or I think it's important. Yeah, well, some of those companies are, but again, I think I'd suggest that's an exemplary way of having arm's length between the sponsor and the sponsoree, so there's no conflict of interest yeah. and no perception of any... Well, it was one of those things, I, I actually, um, <laughs> I almost got into terrible trouble because I went to the, um, the vice provost in charge of research and said, look, I've got this dilemma because I want to do this programme. I think I've got industry, industry interested, but you know, CCS was already, you could see NGOs were split. This is quite controversial. And I, I want to be seen as completely independent. Yeah. And they said, well, we've got this model of research called donation model where they literally give you the money, but they don't pay any overheads. Um, and that's what they get out of it, you know, so they get, and they, their name is on the bottom somewhere, you know, helped by, but there's no deliverables. And I like that model. Um, when I told it to my head of department, she was horrified and <laughs> said, where are my overheads? I want my overheads. And I said, no, no, this is what's been done. Uh, so I, I, sort of within my own department, I was in disgrace for a bit, but then come the research ex assessment exercise. And you remember there's a sort of thing for impact. Yes, and they yes. suddenly discovered my program. Oh my God, I'm a lawyer and I've got Rhea Tinto and Schlumberger and people supporting this. And so I became one of the case studies. So I, I <laughs> recaptured my reputation. So but, time's cracking on. I'm going to ask you a couple yeah. of questions about specifics then. Sure. I, you know, I'm still intrigued by. So with ownership of liability. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's got a laugh already. Go. So with, go. with radioactive waste in the UK, it's my impression that effectively the government owned agency takes responsibility for the radioactive waste about 10 minutes after it comes out of the reactor and okay. therefore lands that responsibility with the taxpayer ultimately. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, by contrast uh, with carbon dioxide, the government seems to want to run as far away as possible from uh, taking on any long duration liability af even after the CO if the CO2 has been injected and stored for 30 or 40 years and most people would say that was secure and safe. We still haven't managed to cross the bridge officially in European countries about a government taking on liability. Why do you think there's these profound differences of approach? Well, um, I think it was partly, I'd say it was the industry itself, because I remember early days in when the EU directive was being developed. And I remember raising at a conference the end, just what you're doing now, the analogy with nuclear power and liability. And I, and I said, well, perhaps the model we should be looking at is um, the nuclear industry, because as you know, the nuclear industry, and is probably a similar problem. To, see, you know, there was a ter terrible problem about insurability because you've got, you know, theoretically a very, very low risk. And this was pre Three Mile Island of anything happening. Well, if it does, it's, pre it's pretty unpleasant. And that's, that's not, 
not easy to ensure. And so we introduced international legislation which caps the liability, basically. Um, but when I mentioned that, the industry said, don't even mention the word nuclear. We don't want to be, you know, even thought to be analogous to the nuclear industry. We are just, you know, this is quite a conventional, safe. We don't want any of the kind of associations with nuclear. So that rather um, dropped by the wayside. And I think that the, particularly the EU, as it was the first one, I mean, their analogy and what they were clearly, the precedent they were drawing on was the, was the waste disposal industry, the disposal of ordinary waste. Um, and you can see much of the, the models were done on that. I think to be what you do see, I mean, almost all around the world where there has been specific legislation developed, um, it does at a certain point, it recognizes these are very long, long hauls. Um, it's got to be there, stored, you know, what, forever, a thousand years or whatever. So at some point, nearly every uh, regulatory system has a point where you basically hand back the storage operator, hand back the controls to the government. Now, it doesn't mean that they will pick up the future liabilities if anything happens um, after that point. But you're right, there, there are, um, the liabilities before that are the storage operator under the EU model picks that up. Obviously, there are complicated contractual arrangements going to go on between the storage operators and the producer of the CO2 and transport and all that too. And that's what you normally do. You then reassign the liability. You know, you are liable. To, you are liable under the law, but you can recover certain contributions. And that's presumably going on. Those commercial arrangements are going on um, all the time. So I think in a way that, that um, I mean, lawyers do get very excited about liability. And I think when you're um, talking about disposal under land, you know, there are potential real problems of groundwater, things like that. I think under sea, and you'll know that, that the really, although we can produce theoretical models, the, the liability issues um, for what I call liability for ordinary damage to other people's interests yeah um are not very significant and i th i think and again um or there'll be other people here i think now those sorts of risks um there is insurance available for that for ccs i mean i think that because that's the critical thing that if you can get unless it's completely outrageous premium if you can get insurance cover if it's accepted as a sort of risk we understand or we can we can model then uh then that's fine um, I think we might want to come back onto that. And I think the, the weakness and the difficulty of the, particularly the EU system, was also introducing liability for emissions trading and future what happens, any benefits that are being gained. Mm -hmm. And that's almost impossible to model what, you know, what are the liabilities in 50 years' time. And I, to my own view, that, that, was a, um, that was a mistake, actually, going down that route. Or there are different better models um, uh, 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 available. Oh God, there are lots of questions coming up and I can't yeah, read. I'm to move on to a question now then, so, because time's cracking on. But yeah. on that, uh, we talked about the European uh, directive on CCS, but of yeah. course we've also got the complexity of the OSPAR uh, yeah. Marine Treaty and then the London Convention and its protocol and its annex or whatever it is. So I have a question from Martin Watts who says, do you think the London Protocol needs to be developed more to allow cross-border carbon capture and storage industry? So I take this to mean that in strict yeah. terms, CO2 is not a named substance which is permitted yeah. to be transported across the border. So in, under the EU system of law, if it's not permitted, therefore it's banned yeah. uh, because you have to permit things to happen in Europe. So my also understanding is that Norway and oh, I can't remember, Denmark, Norway and Netherlands, I think, did a deal last year. Yeah. Which have allowed them to define if they've got a peer-to-peer a -peer contract, then they can transfer CO2 one to another. But yeah. what's your view of how... Um, oh, well, happens? no, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, the... the um there were particular problems, uh, uh, particularly with the North Sea, um, convention about trans movement of what effectively wastes and it appeared to prohibit that and there's been a long campaign by 
I think it was Britain, Netherlands and Norway, I haven't got all the detail, I wasn't involved in that, um, to try and amend that. But, you know, again, it shows you that there were other countries who are very suspicious of CCS, you know, and this, this is a, still an issue we've got, and we come back to the public acceptability, and they didn't like it. Now, my understanding, in fact, is that um, there's been a kind of not a formal amendment of the convention because they can't get enough votes from the other countries yeah. but they've agreed not to apply it to those cases i think it was last december i think i heard there's a kind of it's a complicated point of law but i think that has eventually been resolved but just about but it does show that you know uh, and these issues take a long long time they can take a long time to uh resolve particularly at international level i mean the eu directive was actually agreed dusted down in quite a short time for E law, it was, it was it was quite interesting, but the international side, uh, that particular problem hasn't quite been resolved, and that's of course where you know you've got a country, and Britain presumably has got a big interest that which has got a lot of resources and actually wants to take CO two from other countries. You know, it's fine if it's within its own jurisdiction, but it's where it's trying to take it and presumably charging for CO two from other countries. But to sort of pursue the point a little bit, though, uh, with the uh, announcement of the now longship project by Norway two days ago, they're explicitly wanting to obtain import of CO2 for paid yeah. disposal underneath Norwegian territorial waters. Yeah. And so if you were advising a multinational company with a reputation to lose, whether it might be a uh, an RWE power or a BP or a, uh, some other a Unilever or somebody, how safe is that uh, that decision in December to found a multi-billion pound project? <laughs> um, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm, I'm not going to, I mean, obviously I'll charge for that, but um, the... Um, I think it's reasonably safe, but I really don't. I mean, I was looking this up quite recently, actually, partly because I thought the question might get raised. <laughs> uh, I must admit, I got, um, I sort of understood the decisions, but I didn't quite, I'm not sufficiently, I'm not, I mean, you know, this gets back to one of the challenges of environmental law, that it covers so much, you know, it covers international, EU, national level. And I, I made a bit of a mistake, but I remember about, I, I mentioned the book about, 15, 20 years ago, I thought, I cannot cover everything, you know, I'm getting overexpanded. So I'm going to really focus on EU law and national law. I, you know, I know my international stuff a bit, but I'm not, I'm not got involved in that. Now, this, this may be, given what's happened with Brexit, this may be a great mistake I made. I should have become an in international lawyer. No. So no. the answer is, I, I'm not going to give you a a definitive answer because somebody might rely upon it listening and then <laughs> very good <laughs> so before we move on to brexit i'll just ask if anybody else has any other i'm just looking at um uh, so martin has a question for brexit so we'll come on to that later yeah. on I, do, I mean i just mentioned with um i think it's ian mckinley yes i did work with um john horton who sadly recently died when he was um chair of the royal commission and you know, he, he was very good. We worked on transport issues and things like that. I think he found, um, he found dealing with government difficult, you know, because he thought, you know, look, we've got a rational analysis. Why doesn't government just take <laughs> it on, you know? And he, he did used to find that very frustrating as we probably all do. Um, but uh, but he, he was good. So I did work with him on a um, formal, Formal, formal way. I think so, David. And, and also, I saw about the landfill disposal of yeah. household waste. I, I mean, I, I don't know what you think. I, I, I was always quite interested that, you know, we've always called it carbon capture and storage. I've always felt really it should be carbon capture and disposal because, you know, I don't think realistically, if once we dispose of this stuff deep, deep under sea, anybody is seriously thinking of retrieving it. I know some people do, but um, well, I, I, mean, I always felt we, we ought to have been a bit more honest on that and say, well, this is a form of, it's a form of waste disposal. Um, and, you know, and, and we live with waste disposal, we've lived with 
regulated waste disposal since for 40 or 50 years and yeah. There are occasional problems, uh, but we don't. When I went to uh, when I went to frequent European meetings, then there was certainly a uh, a meme in the room that uh, if you called it CO2 waste disposal, then a different branch of directorate in Brussels would try and charge you landfill tax on it, and so that's. Well, I realise, and I know also in the states, you know, you start mentioning waste law, and people start you know, alarm bells start ringing. But, you know, I just think, mo you know, this is where I get back to the public acceptability and public acceptance of this. Yeah. That, you know, most members of the public would see it as a form of disposal, you know, to call it storage. I mean, if I was at a public meeting and somebody said, well, why do you call it storage? Because you'll say you're going to keep this under for a thousand years and that's what you've got to do. Why don't you be honest and call it disposal? Yeah. I wouldn't have a very good answer to that. You might, Stuart, but... Um, mm -hmm. It's theoretically reproducible in the same way as nuclear waste is theoretically. Yes, but we never call it nuclear waste storage. I mean, no. we don't. Well, there was a phase for five years yeah. when they wanted to. I can it. give you. I can give you a whole legal, <laughs> the whole legal definitions about the difference between storage and disposal. Oh yeah. Anyway, let's move on to Brexit in the closing ten minutes of the Empire here, or whatever it is. So, I uh, discovered on reading this that in two thousand and five. You had a cabinet office appointment, no less, to read a review on regulatory justice and regulations in general and sanctions. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, there was a sort of link in the, a more recent request from government, I think, to, tr to examine how European law might need transposed into yeah. UK law after Brexit. So you did a big review of that in the past yeah. couple of years. Uh, for which you're obviously ideally qualified. So I wonder if you could move on to talking about how how ready are we and does Brexit really mean a bonfire of environmental regulations and we're wide open to chlorinated everything? Um, not necessarily. Um, I, th I think that I mean, there are two issues I'd pick up on this. Um, first of all, you're, you're, you're right. And I think it was a sensible that the government's um, initial, and it's still the policy on EU uh, regulations, is to do what we call a rollover where basically, you know, they are reproduced into national law. You have to change some things because uh, it might refer to the European Commission, so you have to change that to Secretary of State or whatever it is. Um, some of the laws, and we know that with um, such as chemicals of, of, and indeed emissions trading, you can't just roll over as such because they're, they're, they're completely integrated with the institutional system. But I think the general principle of rollover was quite... Uh, sensible and because industry needs a bit of certainty. I think there's going to be, um, there are going to be, some, and we're beginning to see it, but I, I remember raising this early along with the UK Environmental Law Associations. You know, people are going to begin to ask, well, uh, what, what are these laws achieving? Are they really good? And, and this doesn't mean a diminution of standards. It means are the laws right? And I don't think, you know, I think the e EU law has overall been beneficial probably for the UK in what it's done. It's not all right. And the one example which I now see the government is taking up, I mean, there's something called environmental assessment for projects. And that was picked up from the United States. And originally that was meant to be a way of making you as a decision maker really think about the alternatives. You know, you've got a project, could we do it another way? Do we need to do it? Let's really analyze that. But I think in the way that it's ended up in the EU is that it's now really a sort of hurdle that project developers pass. It's a kind of tick box, you know, they produce their planning application and then the study. And I do sometimes wonder, you know, what is this really doing environmental good? Is it really helping the situation or is it just giving lawyers nice time ways of challenging decisions? So I think there are some, will be some serious questions which both lawyers and indeed practitioners and scientists will have to ask themselves, you know, could we do this in a better way? Is it really right? Or are we just relying on that? The second question is, is an institutional one. And it's something that um, I raised and other people started raising after the rollover. We said, well, that's fine for the black letter of the law, whether it's waste law or whatever. But the EU isn't just about the black letter of the law. And one of the particular things is that the European Commission has a, in fact, has a duty to monitor all the member states, how they are actually implementing 
their environmental law duties under EU law. And when they say monitoring the government, it's not just central government, it's all parts of the public sector, whether it's local government or the environment agency. And the commission has procedures where they can start sending a formal notice saying, we think you're in breach, and eventually they can go to the European court and they've done that. And parallel to this, because the commission doesn't have inspectors in all the country, it's not been allowed to in all the countries, it has a public complaint system. So anybody can send them free of charge saying, I've got evidence that my local authority is not complying with this EU directive. So I and other people were saying, well, what's going to happen to this when we leave? What's the substitute? And we said, look, we think you're going to need a, a, an independent national body that performs this role because we have judicial review in this country and it's sometimes it's quite good. NGOs bring it, but they're not systematic. They don't deal with all areas of environmental law. Um, the original secretary, Sir Andrew Ledson, when we, I, and I helped produce this report for you, Kayla, um, she was dead against the idea of a new body. She said, well, if government fails in its duties, it's accountable to parliament and it's accountable in judicial review. And in fact, um, client earth were just in the middle of taking all their air pollution cases against government. And you could say that proved her point, you know, that courts can be powerful. They're bloody slow, I think, but that's another <laughs> issue. Um, but we said, no, that's still not good enough because it's not systematic. And to his credit, Michael Gove then got appointed Secretary of State and he immediately saw the argument. He said, no, we do need an independent body and we need a body because, again, what's interesting about the European Commission is it probably resolves 90% of its cases by discussion and negotiation. It doesn't go off to court. It's, it's only very rare when you've got complete disagreement about the meaning of the law. And judicial review just doesn't really work like that. And so he proposed this body called the Office for Environmental Protection and the legislation is, um, well, it's before parliament at the moment. And the idea is that this will be um, an independent body. It will have primary duties to uh, monitor public bodies, including government, how they are complying with environmental law. It has other important duties and it has powers to eventually take them to court. So I think, in fact, I have argued that even if we hadn't had Brexit, this would be a really interesting body to have because we don't really have anything similar. And, my, my, and you might say, well, why, why the environment? Why not all areas of law? And the argument I always come back with, and I wish it was my phrase, but it's not. Um, there's a phrase called the environment dies in silence. And what that means uh, from a legal point of view is that in many areas of law, let's say intellectual property or equal rights for um, minorities or people, there are always legal interests around who will, you know, if their legal rights are threatened, they, they will go to court or they will raise a fuss. The problem with the environment is that lots of the environment isn't owned, um, water, air and so on. We have NGOs around. But what we've traditionally done in law because of that, we've set up public bodies, environment agency, local authorities, who have the responsibility to look after those. And they are precisely the bodies who often, not necessarily out of ill will, but actually don't comply with legal duties. They're stretched for money, they're stretched for that. So this is why having a, a, a new independent body trying to monitor that, I, th I think is, could be very valuable indeed. Yep. That makes sense. Uh, because we're closing to towards oh, the top of the hour, uh, then I have a question from Martin Watt, which sort of relates a little bit to this, I think. So he said, ask, is Brexit a threat or an opportunity for carbon capture and storage regulation in the UK, especially for the liabilities, for example, to yeah. make it more attractive for people to invest? Um, it, it's probably both. I think there are opportunities. Um, I'm not following this. I mean, I, you know, I, I would keep the basic directive framework, I think, but there are bits of it I would, uh, if government's got the will for it, would be a, trying to amend. Um, for instance, as you know, Stuart, the, the, you know, the wording of the directive, the test you had to satisfy to pass back responsibility to government. Um, I mean, it's almost impossible. All available scientific evidence shows that there is no possibility. And that's much tougher than any other equivalent law in Australia. 
yes. and theoretically very difficult. You know, have you got one dissenting scientist? Could you fulfil it? Well, you and I think the nuclear waste, even. You yeah, know. and I also think the other difficulty, and this is because it came out of landfill and dealing with lots of landfill operators, this sort of model where you have financial security up front, dealing with that. Well, I think there are there are better models. I don't know whether that is a real problem for the industry producing the financial security up front, but it's not helpful because I don't think that's quite the right model. And there are other, um, I think the Alberta legislation has annual payments as yeah. part of, a sort of yeah. your revenue stream, General which is going fund. towards a fund. I think there are better, better models. And also, of course, uh, you know, this is one of the issues about state aid at the moment, that, that you could, um, you, you might have more freedom for government to put in money if it's not bound by state aid rules. But that's one of the issues um, going at the moment. So I think there, there uh, I, th I think at the mo I, you may know much better than I, I think at the moment the policy is not to amend anything, but I think there are some issues I, I would be possibly looking at. Yep. So, okay, so I'll agree with that. So I'm going to have the last question from David Reiner, who's just emerged. All right, hello David. Uh, and it's something I'm interested in Hello, personally as well, that the UK is proceeding along a decarbonising route and we're now going to head for net zero by 2050. So we'll be out of step with other jurisdictions around the world. And so Europe is thinking about a carbon border adjustment. If the UK is outside of Europe, do we do that? Is it legal in world trade rules? Oh, and David <laughs> just appeared personally to make his point. <laughs> Thank you very much, David, for a very difficult question, which I don't think I'm going to be able to answer. Certainly not. I'm, I'm now, we're all, all bloody environmental lawyers now. I haven't become experts in WTO rules, which are <laughs> really quite, quite complex. I tell, no, no, no. I, I start, it's very sad. You know, I start looking at that and, um, you know, what, what, can, what can you do with, you know, state aid under WTO, well, they call it subsidies, I think. And it, 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 it's modeled the same. But the, 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 I, I, frankly, on the cross-border stuff, I, I really don't have the expertise on that, I'm afraid, afraid to say. I mean, we are, as you know, we are, I mean, the UK itself is legally bound to a pretty tough target. And I think the, this is where the Office of Environmental Protection might come in, because I think it's going to be about two or three years time where you know, there's going to be real arguments. This is under just national law, whether our policies and our carbon budgets are going to meet um, the 100% reduction. I mean, we're up to now, it's sort of, it's all all right, but there's going to be a crunch point, I think, on the, um, the law and uh, the climate change law on that. And I'm not sure whether, and this is why I think the, you know, I still think CCS, well, I know the Climate Change Committee say it's no longer an option, it's essential, but I just still think we have to win over public opinion on this. You know, I mean, you know this, David, better than I. And actually, you had a picture of my, David affected my book on carbon capture, because when we originally, <laughs> as you know, we were going to produce it, and we were going to have on the front one of those standard bloody diagrams of the the sea and the little pipe going down and the oh. bed, and it all looks like 100 yards below. And I remember David going to a meeting with David and said, this is so wrong, you know, it gives the wrong impression. And if you want to go through, so we actually changed the whole cover to kind of rock formations to indicate that this is quite different. But I don't think, you know, I, you know, I remember talking to my, my when I got into carbon capture, to my children who were, who were then in their mid twenties, you know, quite sensible. Um, they'd heard all about nuclear and they were a bit worried about it. They'd never heard about carbon capture. And as I explained, what it is, they said, well, that sounds very sensible. I mean, why, why aren't we doing this? You know? <laughs> and I just think that, but I, 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 but I just think if you don't win public round to this in a way, and even though in the UK, it's still going to be under the sea. And so there are problems, you, 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 you know, it's going to end up like fracking and all of that because it's so easy now, particularly with social media to whip up, you know, all sorts of concerns that, um, go on, and I, I, and I just don't know what the what you feel if the industry has been successful at this at government in actually explaining what this really is about. Well, I still think our biggest uh, good decision was to go offshore with the whole carbon story. Yeah, I mean, that certainly people, helped. Most people really don't care. 
<laughs> oh, I would be very wary about. I think you could get a whip up very quickly on that. Anyway, yeah, we'll leave that for another day because we're <laughs> past the hour. And uh, it's if, if anybody's. Um, what's well, Claire says? Uh, uh, oh yeah, climate assembly. Yeah, so the climate assembly has been very skeptical on CCS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Oh well, so that's interesting. Still, no, I hadn't. I'd be. I, that's that's very interesting. Actually. We're still back in uh, 1995, really. It looks like, but uh, we haven't yeah. managed to make any major gains. Anyway, I'm going. I'm overdue to go and supervise a PhD student. Oh, <laughs> so I like it. I don't have to do that anymore. Thank Richard for his. Okay. Uh, I remind the audience that that's his first book on carbon capture and storage, still available through Amazon. And this is his latest bestseller about his life and times, and the, especially the people involved in making environmental law happen in the UK. So that's a, it's not a legal read, it's a social narrative of how things have developed to me. But I also thank Richard for his insights and his um, raconteur expertise in explaining all this to us. Thank you very much. And I, I can see you've got many more books than I have behind me. This is, <laughs> we're playing those games. Well, uh, it's an expensive way of insulating your shed in the garden. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I hope to, um, it's, this is still an issue that really interests me and I think is important. So I hope to participate in these meetings, which I think, I think have been successful. But I think you might want to do one about, particularly given that climate change, um, the, the, the assembly. Yeah, yeah, I think. About public opinion and how it works, because it's very, very difficult. It is. Okay, thank I'll you very much. Back. Thank you again, okay. Richard. Thank you for everybody for dialing in and right. sticking around and asking questions. Yeah, okay. Bye. Thank you, Richard. Bye. Thank you, Stuart. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.